But let's get into this. I call this giving and using what you have. And I also put in brackets this. Um, don't worry, we're not going to take an offering after this. Uh, it's nothing bad with that. I'm just saying I'm not doing that. There's no manipulation involved. But I want us to do a spiritual checkup. I want you to check yourself uh, where you're at. Because it's good for us to kind of, when we talk about a topic, just go, hey, wait a minute, where am I at with that God? Am I, you know, holding back? Am I, you know, more trusting on what I have and I won't help and things like this. So it's good to check. I'm checking myself. As I preach these things, I also put this on myself, okay? So let's get into it. John chapter 6, verse 1 to 14. John chapter 6, verse 1 to 14. Jesus is speaking, or is about to speak, and says this. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those uh, who were diseased. So that's the reason they followed him, not because they loved him yet, but because they were very intrigued at what he's able to do, healing people. Many of us can follow Jesus because of what he can do for us. That's a hint, not because we love him. Let's check our hearts and make sure that the reason we follow him is not so what he can do for us, including save us from hell. If we're following him so because we want him to save us from hell, then we're not following him because we're in love with him. So we need to learn to get to know the one who's willing to save us from hell. Yes, of course, that's great. But I don't want to have a relationship with Jesus because of what he can do for me. In other words, there's a hidden motive, a hidden agenda of why I love him or I say I love him. It's because of what he can do for me, not because I really love him, even if he doesn't do it. This is how you know you love someone unconditionally. Love the Lord the way he loves us is that you're loving him not because of any other condition, not because of what you can get from him or what he can do for you or anything else. Amen? This is love. Same with worship. I was guilty in the past of worshiping God in a time of worship and the songs are playing and I was going through something like I needed my payment to be met or something was going on in my relationship or something like this or my brother or something like that. I would be worshiping so he can fix my problem. And I'm worshiping, come on, Lord, I'm praising him. Okay, now he's going to fix my problem. I wasn't worshiping him because I love him. I was worshiping, hoping that that will move him so he can fix my problem. Look, I'm worshiping you, Lord. Are you going to fix my problem now? What if I pray for two hours? Are you going to fix my problem now? You know that even prayer could be manipulative. Why are you praying? Is it so you're praying because you want to be with him? Or are you being with him so you can say, but I was with you and you still didn't fix my problem. Why are you fasting? The biggest manipulation Christians have used is fasting. Fast enough to twist God's hand as if God needs twisting his hand to love you and do what he said he will do because you believe, not because you fasted. Didn't he say that? Because you believe, not because you fasted. Do we want to fast? Absolutely. Why? Because we want to not feed this flesh so much because we want to be more hungry for him than my flesh. That's I want to deeper in you. I, I want to forsake even food because I want to love you more than food, more than water, more than anything else. Lord, I love you. And every time I feel a hunger pain, Lord, you're my all, all in all. I want to love you more than I did yesterday. Not because I'm fasting because and you need to fix my problem. You need to raise someone from the dead. You need to... No. I will love you, Lord. And your love produces faith. Faith works through love. Your love that increases for Him also increases your faith. It comes with it. So as you love Him because you love Him, as you're fasting because you love Him, that faith will still flow anyway. That increase of miracles will flow anyway. But don't do it the wrong way around. So many have done it the wrong way around. So many fasting that I did was for the wrong reasons. It's crazy. I want to say it like this as well. Many give so they can get. They'll give to the things of God or anything else, Christians, so they can get. Why? Because there's a scripture and it says, if you give and it shall be given to you. But there's a higher level, which is love. What is it? Give because you want to be a blessing. No conditions. And you know what happens? When you give because of love, 
it still gets given back to you. That law still works, but your motive, the reason you do it, you're not doing it so you can give, get. You're doing it because you just want to give. Why? Because that's what love does. Love doesn't seek for what it can take. Love just wants to bless. Time, loving people, going to see somebody, whatever it is, giving someone your clothes or space in your house or anything like that. It's beautiful. It's love. Let me keep reading. A great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased or sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these might eat? He looked at them, and he's like, man, there's thousands here. Where are we going to buy some bread so we can... Feed these guys. But this Jesus said to test them, test him. For he, Jesus himself, knew what he would do. Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves, some bread, five breads, and two small fish. He made sure to say small fish. He didn't just say two fish. He made sure to say how big they were and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the man sat down in number of about 5,000. Listen to this. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. How many men were there? 5,000 were following him. That's not including the women and the children. He just said 5,000 men. It could be 10 to 15,000 people there. And he's saying, oh, you got some bread, five bread. Beautiful, perfect for 5,000, 15,000 people. Only Jesus can talk like that. <laughs> but we're called to talk just like him and believe just like him because he is in us. And we will do the works that he did and greater works because he goes to the Father. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed, distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were all filled, they were full. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments, whatever's left. Gather up what's left over so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. What are we learning here? It teaches us that even if you don't have enough, give what you do have. Do something with your loaves and your fishes. Don't complain or wait for the day for all of the money to come that you need, for all the whatever it is that you think you need for you to begin or for you to help or for you to do that thing you need to do that God has put in your heart. Give the bit that you have and expect the miracle. Expect the multiplication. There was a, a woman that had a son and there was a famine in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And there was this prophet. I always mix them up if it was Elijah or Elisha. It doesn't matter. They're both very similar to each other. The point is, this prophet would walk past, and this woman who had a son at this famine, people were dying and starving. You need to hear this stuff because of the times we're coming to. The times that are happening here in Australia is even worse, in Canada is pretty bad, in different countries around the world, and they want to continue taking and reducing, firing people, not having a job because they're not vaccinated, crazy stuff like this. They won't be able to go into shops to eat, to buy food. We need to understand our God and that he doesn't want us just to sit back and hold on to our loaves and fish going, man, that's all I have left. I'm going to try to hold on as much as I can. He wants, if the time is and the thing is needed, you use it to help. You use it for the things of God and God will do the multiplication because you're showing that your trust is not in what you have or what you see, but in the Lord who can multiply. Amen. So in this story, she says the prophet's walking past her and she's there and he says to her, 
give me something to eat. He, he, in the Old Testament, even the New Testament, they sound pretty full on. Like, they don't sound very kind. They don't sound our version of kind. I'll say it like that because we've created a version of what kind sounds like. But if you read how Jesus spoke sometimes, how the prophet spoke sometimes, it doesn't sound very kind. He goes, give me something to eat. He didn't say, please, oh, beautiful, wonderful woman, caring one. Would you please give me some of your food? Just give me something to eat. Maybe he said, give me something to eat. I don't know. But she said, all I have is some olive oil and some flour. And I'm going to just make a bit of bread, eat it and die. Listen to how full on. That's all I have left. This is our last meal and we're going to die. After we get hungry again, there's nothing for us to buy, to go get. He goes, yes, listen to, listen to him. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So, so make me the food to eat. That's all I have. Me and my son are going to die. Oh, mm -hmm. Can I have something to eat? I'm hungry. Are you finished? Did you hear that? Doesn't sound very kind, but anyway. So she does it. Good woman. Good believer. She does it anyway. And then he says to her, how much vessels do you have? How much pots do you have at your house? She goes, I got this many. And he says, okay, go get them. And then oil kept on running into those jugs until she couldn't, there was no more jugs to fill. So she says, quickly, go to your neighbors and get their jugs, their empty jugs. So she runs and gets the empty jugs from her. Oil was like precious trading currency back then. So she's becoming rich like that. She's becoming well off in a famine where people like her were going to die because they only had enough to make one more bread and die. Same with their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors. And it's overflowing, overflowing oil. Why? Because she gave what she had. She did something with what she had. She obeyed the word that came from the prophet because the prophets speak for the Lord. So she said, okay, I'm going to go past my logic and past trying to save my own life or hold on to my security. What's my security? One more loaf of bread that I have. At least I have something still to last. She said, okay, I'm going to go past that. Here's my last food. And she gets blessed. You need to remember this. For the days that were coming ahead, if they keep going, and that's, that's just the way that's going to go, we don't want to. We're declaring, we're commanding, we're praying, we're believing. But if it doesn't go that way, and it goes even more severe around the world with what's happening, I don't understand and I don't know why, but if it does, we're still going to trust God, but we need to start believing these kind of scriptures. We need to tap into these kind of areas for because it's faith that brings these things. Faith. Not what we see, not our security or anything. So, let's be like this woman that I said. Let's be like this guy that gave up their two... Because remember, this person had to give up what he had, remember? This bread and fish belonged to somebody else in the crowd. They also had to be willing to give up what they had, that they were smart enough to bring with them some lunch for the gathering of the event conference of Jesus coming to preach, he was smart enough to have some food for him and his friends, whatever who they were there. But he said, okay, here you go. And boom, we multiplies. Let's be like that person. But let's not be like this person. You ready? Luke chapter 12, verse 15 to 21. It says, and he said to them, it's Jesus again. Jesus speaks and says, Watch out, take heed, watch out, and beware of covetousness. Listen to this, the complete opposite. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable. Did you, I want to repeat that. One's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That goes a lot of Christians, preachers in the TV going down right there. Because <laughs> it's like prosperity gospel. You know, out of the, if, you, if you don't have abundance, you don't believe because God wants to give you abundance. And then Jesus said, You're, listen to this, Take, beware of confidence for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he has. Does God want you to be poor? No. But don't think that makes you something because of the abundance of what you have. 
And many have taught that if you're poor, it's because you lack faith and God's favor is not on you. What a false garbage they teach. Which is full of covetousness. We were talking about this with some of the youth about if it's okay for preachers. I'm, not, I'm okay for a businessman to have a private jet, but it doesn't feel right either for a preacher to have got a private jet because of the income or the money that comes in from the congregation. Now, if that preacher also has a, a side business that he does and he makes his money from there and then he wants to buy 17 jets, one Ferrari and 23 man mansions, do as you wish and, you know, if God's in it, cool. Not who am I to judge? But it, we're using the money that's coming in from the church, you know, then I don't know about that. Because when it comes into the church, you have to distribute it. Yes, help the preachers that are there giving their time and everything to build up the people, but enough to eat and everything just like everybody else. But then look at what the need is in the congregation especially and help the need of the church. In fact, in Acts where it says that they were selling lands and stuff and giving it to the, to the apostles' feet for them to distribute as people had need. It wasn't so they can go buy a private jet. It's so they can look at what the need is of the people in their church. And he says to help the believers first. Because imagine, we need to make sure that the believers, are you okay? Are you living in a house? Are you okay to pay your bills? We're blessing them. And then we look also outside going, okay, what about the homeless out there? What about the poor and needy out there? And then we continue helping them. We're not going to let our people starve, have no clothes to wear, don't have a place to stay. And then we're running to help some other homeless person out there and our own people are homeless. You understand? So look at the reason why there was abundance. There was an abundance of people selling their fields and everything, bringing the money. And the uh, reaction was to look what the need was to help the people in need. And that's how it still should be. As churches... And ministries, this is what it should be. It shouldn't be, oh, now I'm going to believe the Lord for my next private jet. Then why are you telling everybody else if you're believing the Lord? Don't tell anybody and let's see if someone gives you a private jet without you manipulating them and telling them about what you think God wants you to have. And then some rich guy hears that because they also use more manipulation saying things like, and God will bless you so much if you just give. And I'm going to give you this anointed oil. Really? Is that the olive oil that you were cooking with yesterday? That any year, $49.95? You're going to have this anointed oil. Dude, any Christian can lay hands on oil and anoint it. Period. You don't need this man to put himself on a pedestal with his blinging, ringing ties and suits and then saying, you know, with 3,000 euro dollar shoes... You know, what is going on? Crazy stuff going on. And there's people going, yeah, I mean, I mean. Now, do we believe in the scriptures that says God wants to bless, God wants to give, God wants to make your, your, your barns so full that you don't even have a place to, to put that stuff in? Absolutely. He says that. But you driving this down all along all, all, and using that section because you want to get richer and richer off the people, that is not God's way. This is prostitution. Of the anointing of God. It is prostitution of the things of God. It's harlotry. Too much I'm seeing crazy garbage going around and we justify it. People justifying it all over the place. Are we saying that the things that God promised is not true? Of course it is. But we've got to see the context of the way he was speaking. Does he want the church to have abundance? Yes, because the church in a righteous leadership Holding lots of money is so awesome because they will distribute it where is need. In Nepal, they need to grow more funds for the orphanage that's just opened up another one. For the kids, the mass amount of kids that are needing a place to stay. In many countries, not just Nepal, Africa, Indonesia, Thailand, many countries. And if there's a church, there are righteous leaders are ruling the place. Mate, Yes, my abundance will come if we use the ways of God because we want to be a blessing. And then it's distributed well. I've heard preachers, preacher, get caught out and they came to him with a microphone saying to him, how come you got all these private jets and this and that and this and that? He goes, I'm a preacher, he said. He said, how can I be sitting around 
in a plane with all these sinners and wickedness and demons. If I name him, you will know him. This is the people that we go, yeah, praise the Lord. Jesus would speak like this. Something's wrong. No. And don't shout his name if you know it. Leave him alone. You pray for him. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. I'm saying covetousness corrupts. That's why he said, do not get, get corrupted by covetousness. That's why he used this word. He even says the love of money. He doesn't say money is the root of all evil. He said the love of it is the root of all evil. Because money is the tool right now that we need to buy an orphanage. To buy food, I can't go there and say, praise the Lord. Let me just get some food and I'll arrest you because you stole the food. I need to pay for the food I just <laughs> bought for the orphans, right? So it's a currency, it's a tool we need to use, right? But we shouldn't let that tool have us. Anything we have, we shouldn't have us. I was speaking at a place one time at a house church. It wasn't a house church, it was just a group meeting. And I was there talking and the people came and said at one stage, uh, because I look, I, back in the days, <laughs> I look like a guy that's from the street, like a bum, like I'm talking about homeless, you know, like I'm, I would just dress up like anything and I'm preaching and I'm at the church and all that kind of stuff. I didn't, I just, I was going through a stage with God that I was trying to lose my, myself because I had my, um, there's nothing wrong with wearing good stuff or anything, okay, suits, whatever you want to wear. But the point was, I had my identity in the way I would look. I had a problem with needing to dress up a specific way, so when I started going shopping after this, I would buy the thing that I would never want to wear. So I would go to the worst shop and look at the things I would never like to wear, the colors I would hate to wear, and I go, I'll take that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> pruning doesn't feel good. <laughs> Being corrected and trained up and disciplined by God, chastisement doesn't feel good but it produces such good fruit later that's what it says in the bible and god is dealing with you as sons so i was being pruned because i realized there was a pride in my heart there was an identity issue on what i would look like so i said so i knew what he wanted me to do so i started making sure that i wear completely opposite so at the beginning i'm walking around like because I'm still trying to get through this. It was right in the fresh times. So I'll go somewhere that I'm invited and I look like some guy that needs to be on the street, you know. But it was awesome. It broke me. It humbled me. And then he released me. You know that if you look at my old photos, I didn't have anything on my face. Why? Because I love having hair on my face. I love having other goatee, something there, something. But I had it in the wrong heart. I would do it because I thought it was sexual. Before I came to Jesus, I would have goatee and stuff because I thought it was sexy. Not because I liked it only. If you just like it, cool. But me stupidly, I thought it was sexy. So I was doing it on purpose thinking I'm going to attract the girls, man. <laughs> That's how stupid I was. <laughs> so vague and, 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 and what do you call it? superficial stuff that we put our things in. And so God showed me the reason why I had, I liked having goatees and stuff. So he said to me, I want to set you free from it. God, yes, Lord. And we, you know, we pray this kind of stuff. Yes, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with me, God, I'm yours. We say things like this. And then he goes, okay, shave your beard. <laughs> shave your goatee. And I'm like, maybe I'm not so yours, Lord. Maybe next week, next week, maybe next month I'll be yours. Yeah. That's what we're really saying. You see, he listens to what you're saying. I'm yours, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me, God, I give you my life. Goes, really? <laughs> no problem. You've got a kind of issue with what clothes you wear. You think by looking a specific way, you find your worth. That you become special if you're wearing this kind of clothes or this kind of brand or something. You're already special. So stop wearing them so this dies. And your true identity that I created you to be will rise up. Because now you stop holding on to what you were wearing. When he set me free, it was actually in Cyprus. If you look at some of the pictures here in Cyprus, I want to rip them at times. I'm like, I look like a Buddhist monk, you know, there was like a shaved head like this. And then sometimes I let it grow a little bit longer. And then, and no hair here. It was like clean, shaven. Every time it came a little bit, I wasn't allowed to have it longer than a specific point. So I had to shave it. He was doing this to me. If I say this to people, 
Come on, man, God wouldn't be like that. You know, that's to be legalistic. No, it's because you don't know him that well yet. Because you haven't allowed him to discipline you yet. Because you say, God, do whatever you want with me, and you won't let him when he actually wants to. So you, he will do that. I'm just warning you. If you're really going to go through that. So I went through it. And then I was allowed to start having hair again. He released me. I wasn't going, when, when am I going to have hair again? Here. When am I going to be allowed to wear clothes I like? I wasn't going through it like this. In the beginning I was. But later, I'm like, where's the worst clothes? Yeah, that one? That looks disgusting. Yeah, that's mine. Thank you. How much is it? Two dollars? Here you go. And I would wear it. And I was happy with it. It kept me really, you know, still does. It's done. Now I can wear what I like because I like it, not because I'm trying to impress you. I like wearing this kind of stuff. I like wearing this. I like it. Because I like it, not because of to impress anybody. <laughs> okay? So God's cool and he's got a fashion. It's very fashionable. Don't think when you go to heaven, you're going to see everybody wearing white robes because God forgot how to color any other clothing. All we have is robes. And we all have white robes because we can't have a green one. That's against heaven's religion. He's the one who on his throne around it, there's a rainbow. He's so colorful that even his throne is around, is a rainbow. The sea is a sea of glass, or also known as the crystal sea. Why? Because it sparkles with colors with inside of it. His sea, the ocean in heaven, sparkles full of colors. That's his sea. Imagine swimming in that. You lift it up, and you're like, oh, colors, crystals. He's cool. And one more thing, I want to give you a revelation. God also stands up. He stands up. He doesn't just sit on his throne stuck there. I am God, I cannot move. He walks around in heaven. <laughs> on earth, any way he wants. Just because he says in the Bible, he's seated on the throne. He's seated on the throne. We have this mentality that God stays on the throne. That's it. You want to go see him, you have to go to the throne because he doesn't move. He's stuck. There's super glue. He can't move. No, no, man. He enjoys you. He'll walk with you personally. I have to break. These things are for specific people. That's why they come out. And he sets people free. You're like, yeah, wait. He gets up. Wow. It's a revelation. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. It's freeing because we put God in a box. Let me continue. So don't be like this. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 to 21. And he said to them, Watch out, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Who made sure it yields plentifully? Let me ask you the question. Listen, he said, The ground of a certain man yielded plentifully. In other words, the ground was bearing a lot of, it would literally, he would sow something, it'll bear. It'll be good. Like there was a lot of fruit in what he'll do, everything. Who gave him that ground? Who makes the ground yield plentifully? God. Listen to that. You've got to get all this. Because you've got to know the one that can make the desert bloom with things that grow plentifully for you. I'm sorry. I need to just tell you and we'll go as far as it goes. There was a place in... I forgot it's Mexico or whatever it is. And they, they had a, a drought. No rain was coming. And what happened was the reason why there was no drain because there was a lot of witchcraft. And the guy, his name is David Hogan. He grabbed all the elders or the other Christian pastors and everybody in this area. And they said, in the name of Jesus, it will not rain. And it stopped raining. And there was a drought. And one of the leaders would grow peppers, chili peppers. It was one of his things that he gave his income from. And he said, my peppers are dying. I need them not to die. And he goes, well, do you want us to pray that rain comes back? He said, no, I just want my peppers to grow even when there's no rain. And so they gathered together and they said, peppers, you will grow even though there's no rain. And guess what happened? The peppers grew with no rain. Watch a documentary, not a documentary, kind of, a film, redone film of an event that happened 
with something, his name is Buckingham or something like this, is a South African farmer and it's called Faith Like Potatoes. Listen, Faith Like Potatoes, go watch it on YouTube. There was, he plants it, again, drought, and he was speaking over it, praying over it, all this kind of stuff, and the potatoes grew, and they also saw a sign and wonder with no water. This is our God. These things you need to hear because it produces faith for the times we're coming into that don't think that what limits they give us or take away from us, the governments or the world or whatever, that that's what it is for us. We go past, we have the supernatural God, the miraculous God, even when there's no rain, things will grow. Even when there's no water, he'll tell you, see that rock over there? Go speak to it like Moses did. Water come forth. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. And water will come or hit the water, the, the rock. This is the same God. When they had nothing, he gave them something. He rained manna from heaven, guys. Well, there was no food left. This is our God. But worry and fear will not give you this because worry and fear is an enemy of faith. So the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones. He's got so much, he can't even fit it into the barns. So instead of going, look, let me give some things away. Let me help some poor people and needy people and do some more than what I've been doing since I'm getting so much more. He said, no, let me pull down my barns, which already creates effort and finances, and build bigger ones. Um, and I will say to my soul, uh, uh, so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. In other words, tonight you're going to die. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Notice that he spoke to believers there because he would not say this to an unbeliever. He was giving a parable to believers because he says, so will be with those who are not rich towards God. Yeah? Using this example. In Australia, one of the biggest markets that went up, one of the biggest businesses to have that went crazy at one stage, you know what it was? Buying storage facilities, buying, buying big lands, creating storage facilities because so many people wanted to store their extra garbage. Their house got so full of the stuff they had, couches, extra fridges, extra this, extra that, instead of selling it or give it to someone that doesn't have a fridge, someone that doesn't have a couch, what do they do? Let's pay specific amount every month. Why? For a container to fill my garbage instead of giving it to the people that need it. And it became one of the top businesses to have, filled up with garbage. Many of them, even in America and in Canada, in Australia it's probably happening now too, they would have auctions for containers or, or, or spaces, storage facilities, that were not, uh, no one came to get the stuff that they thought they're going to need to store. So they just have auctions and say, whatever's in there, $500, it's yours. And they go in. Or auctions, yeah. Crazy. Why? Because covetousness. More and more, I need more, 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 more. Even amongst Christians. Why? Because I want to buy my private jail. It's not that they don't do some good stuff too, guys. Don't get me wrong. These guys that have private jets, they're doing some good stuff as well. They'll have orphanages, they'll help different people. So there's good stuff happening too. I'm just saying for a preacher to take from the money of the church and be prosperous that way, I don't agree with that. I believe if you wrote a book and that was successful, cool, no problem. Your money came from your book, excellent. If you had a product you're selling, good, different story, but not from there. Anyway, I will say this is last one, second last, okay. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 to 30. And Jesus is speaking, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, 
who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To each according to his ability. So let me tell you this. When I say talents here, do not think, oh, they can sing. It was money. It was a type of currency called talents back then. But I want you to think of it differently. Think of it also as a, things you're you have things you're capable of doing including singing including writing including you have lots of property including you have lots of clothes including you have lots of stuff in your storage where you can give in anything you've been given because remember god is the one who gives the plentifulness god is the one who gives the wisdom to be able to make the riches that people make so look at all that included in this scripture not just to do with the money or the talents is to do with gifts and so he gives five, two, one. And immediately this master went away on a journey. Verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them. He did something with them and made another five talents. Again, think about your house, your car, your money, your abilities that you have, your talents. Like him, he's got an amazing ability. I'm not saying it's his talent, but he's got ability to really be able to work out things to do with technical things to do with computers. Same with Lucas. They got this. These are also part of this passage. You understand? It's, it's things that we're capable of doing where you might be good at building something with your hands, but let's say Ziga is not good at it. Let's say he is, but let's say he's not. You understand? Because there's people in different things. There's people that love cooking. There's people that don't. Because it's in you. It's been given to you to have this desire to want to do it. It doesn't mean it's your full talent. It doesn't mean it's your full passion. But you just have this ability to do it. Okay? And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. So he did something with what he was given and gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So he didn't do anything with his abilities, his gifts, his money, his whatever he had that was more than what he had. Remember what Jesus said? You have two tunics, give one. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. So I gave five more. I did something with what you gave me. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to them, to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Listen to him, he says the exact same thing. Even though one had more and he did more with it, it's because he also gave him the ability to do more with the more. So God doesn't compare who has more things. God wants you to be faithful with what you have, not compared to anybody else. Amen? His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Exact same reward. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent, your talent, remember how he said it, in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But he, his Lord, answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and, my, at, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And to him who has abundance, uh, and, and, and he will have abundance. But to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I just read it as it is. And all I'm saying is today, do a checkup. What are you not doing something with? What are you holding on to? 
What can you help others with? I know friends right now that have opened up their house because they had space, prayed and thought about it, and opened up a, a, a room in their house for someone that has need that didn't have somewhere to stay soon. That's beautiful. They did something with something that they had. I know different people that do different little things that are amazing to God. They're massive to God. It doesn't have to be as big as that one, let's say, that, as we consider that big one. Little things as well. There's people that hired people to work for them that didn't need anyone working for them. They had enough people working for them. And they hired them because they knew that person was in need and needed money. So he said, look, come work. That was, again, amazing. And God saw that as massive for him. And they gave him when they could have just done the job themselves. Times are coming that this might be needed again. God's way is the best way. And I'm going to read it. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 47. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. This is what will happen in the beginning. They were together and had all things in common. In other words, they were willing to share everything with each other that they had. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. What it's talking about there is most of the time, what I believe is, they, gave, they, they sold whatever was extra that they had, extra possessions that they had. That's what I believe because of what it says next. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So obviously they didn't sell the houses. So they didn't sell all the stuff that they had need of. They sold the things that they possessed, which was extras, that they really didn't need and used it for the things of God. Uh, so And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food in gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Last three scriptures real quick. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 says this. Do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Give and shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Uh, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use or that you give, it will be measured back to you. Last one, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 to 25. There is one who scatters or gives a lot, yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than his need or right. Listen to that. It's not that they, they withhold more than they need to. They can withhold stuff, but he was withholding more than he needed to withhold. But it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. This is the ways of God. But we get rich because of the generous soul that we are, because the more rich we're getting, the more we're going to be given. You get it? Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you so much, God, that you're bringing us back to the simplicity. Thank you for that. We can have your word so we can check ourselves do self-checks, spiritual self-checks, heart checks of ourselves, Lord. Help us see what you want us to see, what we're holding on to as security, where we're holding on to, uh, to feel confident, to feel safe, when you want us to even give the five loaves, the two fishes that we have at times. Help us become those kind of people, Lord God, generous givers, not looking at what we don't have, but looking at how we can be a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray for those brothers and sisters around the world that have been desiring covetousness, using your scriptures for gain, in Jesus' name, manipulation, and thinking that uh, their life is about the abundance that they have. Their life with you is about how much they got. It shows that how much you're loving them or how much favor they have with you. You literally said that is not the case. So we pray for them that they will come to humility to you in Jesus Christ's name and be restored in their heart and that they will even speak out and help others in this in Jesus Christ's name. Help us also be the same, Lord God, in Jesus' name, to really be true and honest with what we do have and how we uh, do this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I want to say this last thing to you before we close. One person, one time a woman said this to me in, the, in a group, a Bible group, and I was like, wow. She said this. Oh, I didn't finish something before. I want to say two things. Remind me about the woman in the group and uh, being poor, okay? A person, I was talking about another group that I was in before. And in that group, the woman said, this, this rich couple were there, and they said to me this, I got a Mercedes, I said, they said to me, like a really expensive one, the, the new one back then. And they said, are you saying I should sell my Mercedes? Are you thinking? I said, no. I said, but if God told you to give it away, would you? That's how you know if you're in love with what you have or you're in love with God more. If God would tell you to give your thing away, would you give it away? Or are you, is that thing has you bound because it causes you to have your identity or you think you're something because of that? But the last thing I wanted to say was that woman said to me this. I go, you know, if, if we have more, we would give more. And I was talking about giving and all this kind of stuff. And she said this beautiful thing. She said, Andrew, even if you have $500 in your bank and that's it for the whole month, struggling, if you're not willing to give out of the little you do have, you will struggle to give out of the much you will have later. And I was like, I never, ever. it was so simple what she said, but it hit me. Because I thought, you know, when you have a lot, you should be giving, blah, blah, blah. But wait a minute, your heart attitude should be already trained up, even with the little you do have. You shouldn't wait for some specific amount before you start being generous, before you start helping the needy, the poor, giving for something bigger than you and your house and your family. And I really touched me. So I remember that and I wanted to share that before we close up. So bless you. God is for us. And he's amazing. He will multiply. Let's just not be afraid. Let's not be anxious for nothing and trust him and give when he wants us to give because he wants to multiply the oil in your jugs. Amen. Amen. Amen.